Hello, today we're going to be talking about activity two and looking at the subdivision radiata, which includes Cnidaria and Tenophora. Um, the activity two video and reading will help you answer questions five through seven on your worksheet. And as a reminder, you should be accessing all the materials, watching videos, and accessing the lecture before attempting, attempting the worksheet or comp assessment. So the ancestral division of radiata. So this includes two phylum, um, Tenophora and Nidaria. And some of the critical innovations um, were the development of tissues. And that made um, the next steps of the animal evolution possible. So we have radial symmetry. So if we draw a line through the center, um, the right's gonna be the same as the left. And there's an increased period of time spent in a mobile for form. So in our Nidaria, um, this is gonna be referred to as a medusa. Um, so we can think of that as like our typical jellyfish. And these are solitary free living marine and aquatic invertebrates. And they include, the phylum Nidaria includes corals, anemones, jellyfish, and box jellyfish, while the phylum Netophora refers to comb jellyfish. They have two major life cycle phases, a sessile polyp phase and a medusa mobile phase that I just mentioned a little bit before. So our, in our phylum Nidaria, again, common names jellyfish, coral, sea anemones, and we also have hydras. And they're in the clade radiata, so um, radial symmetry, two tissue layers, and those are gonna be our ectoderm and our endoderm. And those two tissue layers are, make a organism um, referred to as diboblastic. Um, there's also the introduction of a mesoglia, which is a non-living layer between tissues that consists of mostly water. Um, so it's not considered a true cell layer, but it is a layer um, within, within the Nidarias. And they have two possible mobile phases. So we have ciliated larva and medusa. And then um, we also have a polyp form and that's our, our non-mobile or our sessile um, our form. form. They also have an incomplete digestive system. So that means that they can only take one food in one way. And it also comes out that same way. So um, you can think of this one um, entry and exit serving as the mouth and the anus. So they are taking up food into their gastrovascular cavity where, where that, um, you know, those nutrients are going to be transformed as energy. So we have some cell tissue layers that are important. So the, that endoderm, that mesoderm, and I mean, the endoderm, the mesoglia, and the ectoderm. And these are all referring to germ layers or developmental layers that eventually develop into particular parts of the organism. And we'll, we'll look at that as well. So here is a, a general life cycle of a Nidarian. So if we're thinking of our mobile, our mobile medusa as our, you know, general, what we think of as a jellyfish um, first comes to our mind. So we have two mobile phases. So we have these ciliated um, plan, planule larvae, and they swim and look for a suitable location to kind of adhere to a substrate or, you know, the sea floor and develop into a polyp. And then we have our mobile phase, which is our medusa. And so um, that's gonna be what is producing our gametes and um, developing into a polyp. So when we take a look at this, we have our medusa or free living form, and we have a gonad and they're producing the egg and the sperm, which are coming together. Uh, well, they're released through meiosis and then they're coming together through the process of fertilization. So one haploid egg, one haploid sperm, they're coming together and forming a diploid zygote. 
So this diploid zygote develops through mitosis into a planule larvae. And um, that, you know, mitosis keeps occurring, we're growing, um, adding, you know, new, new cells, replacing old ones. And then we have a mature polyp and um, we're starting to see some, some um, colonies of polyps and we're seeing some reproductive and feeding parts. So here we have a reproductive polyp and then these um, little tentacles are feeding pro process. So these tentacles reach out, um, grab food or, or um, substrate and bring it back into the polyp um, to kind of eat. And so we have this reproductive polyp and then we have a medusa bud, which will um, form through mitosis a, a free-floating free um, medusa. So we'll take a look at this again um, in, in kind of a different form. But if you know, we're spending, or Nidarians are spending a very short period of time um, as a haploid, in the haploid form. So here, just another look at the life cycle of a Nidarian. Again, those two mobile phases, that ciliated larvae um, and the free-floating medusa. And this polyp phase here is going to be sessile or non-moving. And um, the polyps exist for a really long time uh, until they experience some sort of stress. And then they're like, oh no, we have, to, we have to move, we have to get out of here. So then a reproductive polyp will form, mitosis will occur, and that free, free floating medusa is formed so they can go and, um, reproduce, create that genetic diversity, and create a zygote and larvae, and eventually a polyp in a new location that may not be at, under as much stress. So this is just another way to look at how medusas are produced. The development from ciliated larvae to the polyp to medusas. So here we're looking at these pictures one through three in this diagram. And so that's demonstrating the mobile larvae stages. And, um, you know, they're kind of searching for a good place to call home. Um, and then through four through eight are where the larvae attaches, grows into a polyp. And then nine and 10 is where the polyp strobilates um, or the asexual reproduction um, occurs. So the segmentation that we're seeing in, in, these, um, in these here, the nine and 10, we're seeing these lines or the segments. So each one of those lines is going to produce a medusa. And you can, you can see it here in number 11 about how they, they kind of separate and turn into individual medusas. And then from there, we, we see that the, you know, those polyp segment detaches and forms the medusa, which floats away and then eventually um, you know, produces larvae and they go off and try and find a suitable, suitable site to reproduce and live um, in that polyp form. So here we're looking at those tissue layers. So remember, we only have two true tissue layers, and that's gonna be our ectoderm and our endoderm. Um, but we do have that mesoglea um, layer, uh, but it's not considered a true tissue. So these, this is a polyp here, and then this is a medusa, and they're very similar in structure, um, but the medusa is the mobile form. So, this incomplete digestion that we talked about is accomplished through the acquisition of food, which enters through the mouth or the anus here. And um, the food is digested by the gastrodermis, which is lines the outer layer of the gastrovascular tissue or gastrovascular cavity. And the nutrients are absorbed and the waste is sent out right the same way that it came. And we can see how these layers that exist in the polyp are also um, present in the, in the uh, medusa, but we do need to note that the ectoderm develops into the epidermis, while the endoderm 
develops into the surfaces that line the direct digestive tract or the gastrodermis. Um, so this is just an example of how how these tissue layers are distinct in the two um, most, you know, two only and most important um, tissue layers for, for the Nigerians. So as you're probably aware, um, jellyfish can sting you. So now we're going to talk a little bit about um, how Nigerians and some um, Bediforians use specialized stinging cells, which are called nidocysts, and they're located at the very end of the tentacles. Um, and they can, can sting you and they use that to capture prey. So if we zoom in and look at the tentacle, um, they've got these little, little um, cells that are called um, nidocysts. So this entire thing is a nidocyst. And then on the end, it has like this trigger. And then on the inside, um, they, have, they have this nemocyst that's released when the trigger is activated. And um, it kind of like plunges out like a harpoon and can wrap around and grab um, prey or you if you're walking by um, in the ocean. So. So that's kind of the, the basic rundown of, of that mechanism. And um, these stinging cells are found on the epidermis. So if we're looking here, um, that's the epidermis. And um, they have a toxin within their um, you know, harpoon-like structure, and um, it can immobilize the prey. And um, just something to note is that um, the tentacles of the nidocytes um, can be found on both the polyp and the medusa form. So if we think back to that stationary um, polyp, they're having tentacles come out and they're using that same sort of um, trigger method to, to capture prey. So just to summarize, we were looking at the group of Nidarians, so that included jellyfish, which we kind of used as our model organism. Um, it also includes sea anemones, which are sessile um, polyps, and they have many hollow tentacles that also include stinging pneumatocysts. Um, they're able to form symbiotic relationships with clownfish, so think Nemo, finding Nemo. And then we have corals. Corals um, are kind of like small anemones, but they're encased in calcium carbonate. I'm sure you've read and learned about coral reef bleaching. Um, and partly that is due to, um, to the symbiotic relationship that, that corals need to survive. And we'll talk about this um, on the next slide a little bit, but they, they have polyps that extend out of the hardened structure. So you can see here this top photo, those are some, some nice little polyps. Um, they, they, they come out to feed and then they kind of retreat back inside of the coral um, to, to be protected and safe. And corals can exist by themselves or they can exist in a community forming what we know as a coral reef. And then last but not least, we have a hydra. And this is basically just a sessile polyp phase. Um, they don't actually have a medusa form. So what we're looking at here is the, the only part we're, we're going to see um, throughout its entire life cycle. And typically um, they're, they're just kind of hanging out in the substrate or the sand and um, feeding and interacting in that way. So here we're taking a look at the coral anatomy. So these are examples of little polyps. And this is the feeding part. So look, we have that mouth um, opening and it's one way. Um, so everything that goes out comes back in, um, or no, everything that goes in comes back out. And so here are just some notable um, Parts. So we have our tentacles, our pharynx, the septum surrounding um, the, 
this polyp. And then um, inside we have the nemesis. So we just looked at that zoomed in picture. So that's gonna have our trigger and that part that comes out and is actually able to capture food and immobilize it. Um, we have zooxanthellae. So um, corals actually form symbiotic relationships with zooxanthellae and they, they depend on them um, to help acquire food and nutrients. So um, zoos and are, are mobile, so they can get up and kind of swim away um, when their life cycle permits. However, corals are sessile, they can't go anywhere. So when environmental stressors happen, like increased or decreased pH, major temperature changes, um, oil spills, that sort of thing, um, the zoos and thali can be triggered with that environmental response. Like, hey, we, we really need to get out of here. Um, this is dangerous. We need to find a better place to live. And so they are able to take that, that kind of mobile part of the life cycle and go find a new suitable habitat with a kind of a, a coral host. And um, without the zoos and thali, the coral dies and it's not able to get the nutrients it needs. So it actually leads to coral bleaching. So that's what we're looking at here, kind of that image of um, a bleached coral. So, um, so corals, they use those tentacles to bring in those food, food parts to their, their gastrovascular cavity. Um, just to kind of reiterate, they are diploblasts. Um, they have an ectoderm and an endoderm, and they are cnidarians. So that's the end of that's the end of activity two material. Um, go ahead and answer the questions corresponding with activity two on your worksheet, and read the handout. And um, yeah, and we'll we'll get back together for activity three.